<laughs> maybe you could talk about how you got involved with the film, please. Yes, um, there was huge excitement um, because as we all know, Woody really made movies in New York and never left New York. So uh, there was a big buzz around London at the time that Woody Allen is going to make a movie, he's coming to London, he's going to make a movie. And I said to my agent, oh God, you know, I'd love to get involved in this. Didn't think for a minute it would happen. There were loads of much, much bigger names than me who I'm sure were going up for it. You know, he's got cult status and anybody who's a movie maker, I guess, would be interested and curious to work with him. So um, given also his fantastic movies that we'd seen in the past. Uh, so um, interestingly, I managed to get an interview. My agent got me an interview with um, Helen, who was his, uh, one of his producers, his line producer, really. And uh, he, I discovered, doesn't interview people for jobs. He just, he uh, just either gives them out or asks you to do it, and, or he sends Helen out. And so the gorgeous Helen, we met in a hotel bar um, on, um, where did we meet? I can't remember now. I think it was maybe the Dorchester. I can't remember. Anyway, um, over, she had a whiskey and I had a Prosecco or a glass of champagne. And we just chatted. We chatted and chatted for ages. We got on really well. And I just thought, that was a nice interview. I won't hear any more. You know, that was a very nice interview. Nice way to spend an afternoon. Lo and behold, <clears throat> the job is offered to me. Oh, terrific. So, um, so I had to have a conversation. It was hilarious. I had to have a conversation with him on the phone from New York. And uh, he came on the line and I'd started the production. I was in the production office and um, he came on the line to me. And, you know, this iconic voice, which we all know. And I just had this real surreal moment where I thought, oh, my God, I'm talking to Woody Allen. Um, and I thought, keep it cool, keep it cool, you know, just try and sound vaguely intelligent. Uh, anyway, and then he, I did some mood boards for him. Um, he notoriously hates costume. He doesn't like costume. He doesn't like people. He'd rather the actors wore their own clothes. Wow. So he doesn't, he doesn't like any of that side of things. He doesn't like things to be staged, considered. He'd rather, like I say, he'd rather people wore their own clothes. And what he is big on is he doesn't meet people either. He doesn't meet actors. If he does meet them, which is rare, um, and if they've dressed for the interview, he will, you will probably get a note, I liked what he wore at the interview, oh. or I liked what he wore on the casting tape. So, um, so you're up against that from day one with him. Right. Um, so when I arrived with all my mood boards and he walked in, this diminutive little man, you know, his glasses, <laughs> And very cool, you know, very great, actually. I, re I liked him immediately. We hit it off immediately, which was brilliant. And by then I wasn't phased by this iconic filmmaker. Um, we went through, you know, mood boards and what he felt people should look like. He said to me, I'm guided by you because this is a very English film. And he had his perceptions, which we were fighting against all the time with him. The Americans have perceptions of how the English dress, which is very cliched actually, and it was quite a battle to right. sort of get over that. Um, so he had his ideas, but he was guided by me. Uh, lovely Nikki Kentish Barnes, who was our English line producer. Um, she, she's got a posh bird. So she knew a lot of um, aristocratic people. And, it, and you know, he'd gone and seen, um, He'd gone to locations and met these people. So he had a preconceived idea of what he thought he wanted. Um, so we started, you know, we had the script, we, it was cast. Um, we, Scarlet was a late addition to the movie. Um, we'd had somebody else attached, but that hadn't worked out. So Scarlet was a late addition. So it came in literally two days before the camera test. Wow. We, we had um, done, <laughs> we got all the clothes together and he wanted to camera test everything. He said, I'm not going to know until that's on camera. So even when he was standing there in the studio, he still couldn't tell me if he liked anything or not. He wanted, <laughs> to, see it. He wanted to see it on screen, which was interesting. And it was hilarious, the camera test we did, because we were also silent, the whole crew were very silent. He, we were intimidated by him because we didn't know how he 
worked and he stood literally, he didn't watch a monitor, he stands right by the camera lens and intensely looks at what the, what the action is. And so um, we were intimidated by him and he was intimidated by our silence because American crews are notoriously, well, New York crews certainly are notoriously very vocal, very loud, and we were silent because we were worried about him. But right. as, I, as I found out afterwards, he was terrified of us. <laughs> so it was only when we were testing Scarlet the next day that I said, should we get some music or something? And he, um, you know, he's a great jazz fan. So uh, we had music and then it all relaxed. And I think we all knew that we were frightened of each other. So we all relaxed into it. So then it became fun. Right. So we, we had days of camera testing of various things, each character. Um, but he couldn't tell me anything. He couldn't give me any feedback until he saw it on screen. So I had to sit next to him in rushes, you know, when, when they got the, the uh, tapes printed. And uh, we just sat and he watched them and he was making comments to me all the time what he liked, what he didn't like. And that's how we started. Interesting. It's fascinating. I didn't know that he had no time for costume. I'm wondering, is that perhaps down to him being so prolific? I know he, he, or he, he used to write at the script and then direct the film within the same year. So there has to be some kind of system where I'll it's let very you into a secret. Please. I'll let you into a huge secret. Um, he apparently, which I think is fantastic, he has, he writes a line for an idea. Yes, just he has ideas. So he writes a line for an idea, it's screwed up and thrown in a filing cabinet. <laughs> and each year he picks out a line and he writes a film. And that is apparently how he wrote Annie Hall. Wow, I was, yeah. well that's fascinating. I, I think yeah. I saw a documentary on something where he has a drawer and then he'll, mm -hmm. he opened the drawer and he goes, well, this is about yeah. a magician that will come through yeah. the ground. And the, the, so he has like a whole wrap of ideas that he can just write yeah. now. They just get tucked in a filing cabinet and he picks one out. That's and that's nice. how he makes, that's how he makes them. Um, yes, so he, uh, yes, he's a fascinating guy to watch and work with. He really is. But he would, he would, you know, even though he'd signed off on things in the screen test, which was hilarious, actually, retrospectively, not so hilarious at the time. You know, we were always miles away from where we were filming. You know, filming in London's always a minefield and they can never get the unit base near the location. So we were sitting in the um, pub in Mayfair, the one on the corner, I can never remember its name, um, on Mount Street, lovely pub. And um, Scarlett had come to talk to him. And he said, well, you better go and get dressed, you know. And, and she said, no, I'm wearing my costume. And he said, that's what you're wearing. So I was called. I was always called to the set. Um, you know, what else, what else have you got? That's what I, that was, <laughs> that, was the, that was the mantra every day. What else have you got? So the whole of the costume truck used to be offloaded and taken in previous and, you know, on location. And we would go through various machinations of costume for him to approve or not approve wow that's, that's awesome. how we worked yeah. every day that's incredible yeah. and yeah. i was going to ask you jill it's a very british not only is it set in london but i think the style is also very british so you mentioned that um woody perhaps had perceptions of how the british dressed and then you perhaps had ideas of how we really do dress can you remember what those moments of difference were between you and him well, I think he all thought we were all wearing deer stalkers and smoking pipes <laughs> and having capes and check coats with capes. So I, th I think that was really the English, the, their, their perception of English people. Right. So, you know, but, you know, it's all very cast dependent as well. You know, so there we have Johnny Reese Myers, who is a good looking boy, uh, very slim, used to model. Um, so you know, he couldn't actually wear, and he quite very slim, very slim mm. guy. So couldn't really wear uh, particular brands. So he had to, I think he ended up actually in, um, um, uh, who did he end up at? Geeves number one, Geeves number one range, right. which I think is no longer with us. Um, uh, because they were very slim cut suits. Right. So the blue stripe you were alluding to, Yes. And there's a, there's a brown one, there's a brown suit I noticed in the images that you were, um, and they were Geeves number one. 
Oh, okay. So they had a very slim cut, and okay. they looked good on him. They looked well, good on him. He's. Uh, I was thinking about this earlier. He, he's a. He's not just handsome, Jonathan Rhys Myers, but mid twenties, Jonathan Rhys Myers is almost pinup, like boy band esque, isn't he? So he's yeah. the sort of uh, guy that you would actually just see on a wall of a, a teenage bedroom. I think he's. He's got. Yes. And I think that. Uh, attachment to Scarlett Johansson who they both have this kind of smoky eyed quality don't they so you can you can almost forgive him for having this affair during the film because it feels like it's natural that these two should be having an affair somehow well yes it did and and and, and there was a good fit there you know that the audience I think responded to that you know to us they looked very good together yeah and so when two when people look good together you want it to be happy ever after right. you know you kind of want it to fit in and you know, so, yeah. I was wondering, I was talking to my girlfriend last night as we watched it again. I said, why is it that we're cheering for him? Why are we wanting him to get away with it? Even though he's now turned into a murderer and he's, you know, a, an adulterer and all this sort of thing. He's a, he's a liar. We were like, but yeah, if he got caught, it would be horrible. You know, we're with him the whole way and we always want him to get away yes, with it. Yes, right you sort of, because it's like, I mean, that was the, the, um, the um, subject matter. Woody was actually... A, a, you know approaching as what happened you know there's the famous tennis ball which side of the net is it going to fall and the circumstances that follow those uh, could be two very different circumstances I mean interestingly you know when I did sliding doors it was kind of the same premise you know she misses the train she gets the train so it's two you know a whole situation of events can happen on well like the slicing of a tennis ball in Woody's case or a, tu a tube train door in Sliding Doors case. Yeah. And I think that was what was quite interesting about Johnny's story, his story that, you know, it could have gone one of either way and he was lucky. Yeah. <laughs> fate, fate was on his side. Right. And I think even though he was, I don't know if he was necessarily a bad character. I think just situations just grew out of, out of other situations without necessarily him being able to control them. Yeah. And I think, so that's why I think the audience were probably, because it can happen to any of us, you know, it could happen to any of us. Well, the, and I was also thinking the fact that Scarlett Johansson is the ultimate temptress, really. Um, you know, even in the film, other guys are alluding to, you know, oh, I would have done the same. Did you see her? Or like um, Matthew Good is even commenting about his ex-girlfriend saying, oh, she's still got the come hither look. You know, it's, it's almost like the, the woman that no man can refuse. Resist, so, yes. Yeah, resist except, except he wanted to choose the, the privileged life. Right. So he basically wanted his cake and eat it. Yes. And when and when she threatened his privileged life, that's when he had to step in. That's right. And yeah. I was also going to ask you about when he does get the job and he goes into the corporate world, you start to see him in perhaps uh, better suits in terms of like more appropriate for his lifestyle, but he's not quite wearing them with comfort. You often see him kind of wrestling with his tie. Um, you see him like buttoning up every button on the suit jacket. Was, was that a conscious choice to kind of let the audience know that this is not his world? He's trying to inset this world. No, we, no, not really. Well, it was in terms of us trying to give him a better suit. You know, we, we started off with a, a cheaper suit and got more expensive with him and a bit more styled. Um, you know, I was careful about his shirt and tie choice. I didn't want it to be so um, formal that, you know, I wanted him still to have a little bit of um, pizzazz to him, a little bit of sexiness. He had to look sexy. Mm. I wanted him to look sexy. You know, the audience had to fall in love with this guy. Yeah. So I didn't want him so formal looking like a banker, you right. know, which is why we gave him the gray shirt, you know, the, the toque ties, the, you know, his colors were getting warmer, softer. And also Woody hates blue. Oh, right. Okay. It doesn't like blue. In shirts, in jackets, and suits. In anything. Right. It doesn't like blue. That's so if you look at most Woody Allen films, uh, and I had an argument with him about this, because I said, the problem is, Woody, your films look muddy. You know, because you look at most Woody Allen films, and they have a muddy quality to them, because he's, he loves warm colours. Right. So everything is taupes, browns, you know, it's all warm, earthy hues. He does not like blue. 
And I said, but you have to have a little bit of blue to counteract the mud. Right. So as we got down the line, you know, I did three films with him. Um, we, we sort of, I sort of won that battle a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, but he does not like cold colors at all. And mm -hmm. I think it was uh, the cinematographer Gordon Willis that said to him, blue was actually, well, he thought it was an unfriendly color. Uh-huh. Okay. So he, he much prefers warm tones. So, you know, we were trying to find Johnny, even though he's in a blue suit, we were still trying to get Johnny into warmer, uh, earthier colors. Hence okay. his ties are all have brown hues. There was uh -huh. one Gide suit, which was lovely in a brown tone, cold brown, but it was very nice. Um, so that was constantly in my ear. Right. You know. okay. It's fascinating that directors can have predilections towards colors. You'd often oh, think, God, well, yes. you'd think the character would kind of dictate the color that would suit them or the actor would nope. dictate, but having the director come in and say, no, this is not going to be. Yeah. Them. And sometimes, you know, in some, a lot of Woody's films, sometimes for me, it doesn't work. Mm. Uh, and sometimes it does. And also, you know, inherently he's right. He is writing about himself most of the time. Yes. Woody. Yeah. And so, you know, he dresses in a very particular way, Woody. Um, so really, I think he likes a lot of boys to dress like him, all mm -hmm. the actors. And you can see that in a lot of his films. Annie Hall especially, I suppose. I mean, Ralph Lauren was... Um, oh, yeah, he loves Ralph. Well, Ralph's a good friend of his. Right. Um, so uh, he loves Ralph. I love Ralph clothes. I, I'm a huge fan of Ralph. And there's a scene um, in this film where he comes out of Ralph Lauren as well, doesn't he? John yeah. Henry's oh, mind. yeah. 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 <laughs> so, uh, no, I'm just trying to think. I don't think Johnny ever wore anything. I'm just trying to think if he wore anything from Ralph. Other people did. I don't think Johnny did. Right. I don't think Johnny did. Yeah. Well, yeah. Jill, thanks so much for coming on and taking us down memory lane with Match Point. It's currently available on Amazon Prime, and I, I really recommend people watch it. <laughs> It, you, you can just, I mean, it's two hours and change, I think, long, but, you know, you really just rollick through it. It's, it's a great, it's a great I'll film. have to watch it again. I'll have to watch it again. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I will. I, it's 16 years since I've seen it. So, uh, is that? Yeah, no, it is. Do you not often watch films that you've done? Is, or is this just no. the president? I'm like Woody Allen. I'm like Woody Allen. You know, he right. never watches films. He never watches his films. Really? And, and there was a document, I think Mark Commode interviewed him a while ago and was trying to play excerpts from films to discuss and he turned the chair around he wouldn't look at the films <laughs> so he never he never ever watch once he's done the edit that's it he's done he he's on... you know the, at the premiere he doesn't stay he doesn't watch it really so and I, and I guess i'm a bit like woody no i don't watch my films again i do them i look at them and then that's wow. it and is it because you just want to look forward? It's onto the next project. It's like no time to lose, or you just don't have that nostalgic streak yeah, in you. It, no, I'm very, I'm very sentimental. I'm very nostalgic. I think what it is, I just always think I could do better. And so what it does, it highlights things when you look at things in a cold, calculated way. And you know, I know the situation that why something was chosen, and it's not necessarily always for the right, for me, for the right reasons. You know, you're sometimes under pressure. You sometimes, you know, you've got a director saying, no, we want, I just want this color, which you don't necessarily agree with. So, so no, I, I, I always think when I look at my films, God, I could have done better there. You know, that could have been a bit better, I think. But uh, so no, I very rarely look at my films again. Very rarely. Well, I, rare. I implore you to watch this one again, because I think you'll enjoy it. <laughs> Nice. Jill, thanks I'm so much for coming on and uh, best of luck. I know Mission Impossible 7's in, in the mix and it's still going on. We're halfway through it. Halfway, halfway through. through the shoot. Um, we're Good we're fun. huge fans. Good fun. Yeah. Good. Well, in this household, we're huge fans. Got the Blu ray. Which box one is set. that one you've got? Oh, you've got oh, the whole is, box set. This is all of them. Yeah. We go to the IMAX and um, we, we think he's a force of nature in this house. We're, we're right behind him. So he, I'm here to tell you he is a force of nature. He absolutely is a force of nature. And if you look on YouTube at that jump he's just done off a cliff in Norway on a motorbike, it's incredible. Oh, wow. That's up there. There's, there's a part of me that wants to rush and watch it. And there's the other part that wants me to say, wait it for until the cinema. The what they've done actually and i keep saying to them you've got to release this what they did for the studio was give them it like what we call a teaser trailer and uh they they did the sort of build up to this jump and that should be released on its own back because it's fantastic it's 
fantastic. I think I saw I the cried. I, I cried. When I, I said to them, I cried when you did this jump. It's fantastic. Just the build up and all the music and everything. It's great. I cannot wait. And I hope you'll find time to come back on and uh, discuss some of the suiting. Oh, yes. And what's I'll come going and on with the film. talk about his suits. Yes, I will. Please do. Please do. All right. Peter. Thanks again, Jill. Enjoy your weekend. Nice.